Welcome to the Association 4.0 podcast, your association's no-fluff playbook to navigating and thriving in Industry 4.0 or the digital marketplace. Each week, we bring expert insights to help you and your association stay ahead of the curve. Welcome to the Association 4.0 podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Today, our guest is Allison K. Summers. Allison is Executive Director and Chief Executive of Zonta International. She's a global business leader, an author, and a sought-after speaker. Allison is a former president of the American Marketing Association and an expert on branding, startups, executive leadership, association governance, and more. Um, She is the author of Building Your Brand and Connect to Influence. Allison also has her own podcast, uh, CEO Nation. So welcome to the program, Allison, and thanks for taking time to join me today. Well, Sherry, I'm so excited to be here, and I feel like I get to be like a little special part of the OrgSource family by being interviewed on this podcast. That's great. Thanks so much. Um, so tell us about uh, Zanta and your background. I like to say I fell into association management kind of by chance. I'll also say I fell into my entire career, I, I think, by chance. I was originally a, went to school to be a teacher and I taught for a few years and relocated to Detroit in August. So you can't get a teaching job. And I filled in as a temp employee on somebody's maternity leave. And I actually parlayed that into my entire career. It was in the live events and experiential marketing space doing auto shows and trade shows and Um, And I did that for many years, doing marketing and branding and promoting other people's brands. And I had an opportunity to go and join the team at Smith Buckland. And I worked for the Society of Incentive Travel Executives in the MICE space. So meetings, incentives, uh, conferences and events. I had a wonderful time there for about six years. And then I had this opportunity to interview with site and still use all of my international background and experiences and help an organization that really seeks to uplift women in the world. And, and Sherry, I, I know you know me and, and that what could be more on point for me than just you know helping others achieve a better life and what they need in, in life. So it's been a joy to be at Santa. I've been here nine years so far. That's fantastic. And yeah, I didn't know uh, how you got started. So that was, that's very interesting. Um, so tell me about, I understand that Zanta was honored with the ASAE uh, Summit Award. And I guess that was last year in 2021. Uh, tell me about that recognition. Yeah, we were so excited. It was really, we needed a boost for the team. I think in 2021, you know, everybody had been living with the pandemic for a while. And so we were really committed to applying, not only because of the great work that we were honored for, but so that it could be a win for the team. And and also I just advise anybody that is working in associations as an executive director or something to look at this uh, because it's a great thing to put on your resume and, and just to get recognition for your organization. But We have this project that we've been executing with UNFPA and UNICEF on the global program to end child marriage. We started it in 2018. Each year, 12 million girls are married before they turn 18. And in the United States, there's only about four states that actually have a law prohibiting marriage under the age of 18. And so think about this, Sherry. If you are under the age of 18, and you are a, a female or a male that is in a battered or abusive situation, you are still considered a minor in the eyes of the law, even if you're married. You can't hire an attorney. You can't stay at a domestic violence shelter. You can't even get a lease for an apartment by yourself. So these um, children that get married before they're age uh, 18, if something goes wrong in that marriage, they're, they're stuck. There is no no out. And there are two states in the United States that if your parents walk you in, you can get married at the age of 12. So we're really proud of the work that we've done on this program. And so it was thrilling to be recognized by ASAE with a summit award for it. Wow. That's amazing. Congratulations. And 
Um, what a great uh, project to be working on and, you know, getting the recognition is, is just, that's great too. And like you said, the timing, um, you know, everybody was by last year, everybody was more than worn out. So I'm sure that was a big rallying for the team. So that's awesome. And I, um, I suppose, Sherry, I just got to pause there because it might be difficult for people to understand what Zonta is. And it's because it's not a traditional trade organization or member organization. Zonta International is some more similar. We we belong as part of the service club leaders umbrella. So we hang with Rotary and Lions and Kiwanis and organizations that are membership organizations, but that really focus on delivering service in other ways to their communities. So we help people with um, scholarships and awards, but we also help our own members achieve more in their own lives. So tell me about, you know, some of the challenges and opportunities involved with leading um, an international organization for women. So I think I'd separate those two pieces into two topics. So one, an international organization for, so for anybody listening and my fellow executive directors that work in the international space, it's, it's interesting in and of itself because governance and the vision of governance is so different amongst different countries. And so when you have a board, I have 11 board members and they'll come anywhere from 11 countries, 10 countries. And so you have to get them together and get them to a point of common understanding. So I think in international organizations, it's just always an extra twist because everybody comes to the table with a different perception of what governance is, what financial management is, how they want to launch and execute programs. So, and then we're supporting our members with, we have Santa resides in 63 countries. So it's always a, a bit of a challenge. Then Sherry, layer in uh, that we are basically 98, 99% women. We do have uh, male members and we have a male governor right now in leadership, but it is a lot of, female energy. And, um, and so you, I always joke and say, you got to bring on your, bring on your patients. Um, because it's just, it's a lot of women who join the organization because they want to get a lot of things, a lot of things done. So it's kind of a, a, a trifecta of the international group, the type of individual that would be attracted to a service club organization to start with. And then the female energy. Yeah, (laughs) it's a lot. Um, So another question I have for you is, what are are you seeing as significant challenges for women and and girls across the globe right now? Um, So my immediate gut reaction is access to money. Um, Mm. And there's different reasons for that. It, it, It comes down to so many different things. But one, women are underrepresented in banking and having access to banking in the in the world. They, if they're entrepreneurs or they're starting businesses uh, like you've experienced, um, they're only getting loans at a 79% rate compared to their male co- counterparts who start businesses. And then we all know about the pay gap. Um, and, and so access to money and, and having the resources to, do and achieve what you need to achieve. I mean, in the U.S., we, we talk about the challenges with the cost of childcare and how that creates a lot of barriers for women. And I, I often coach young professional women when they're coming up. And I would say the same thing to young professional men. So I, I don't want to say this is gender only, but you hit this period where, you know, you might be paying $25,000 a year out of pocket for childcare. And then you do the math on your income and you start to say, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. But then I always say, Sherry, you're not working for your income today. Like, yes, it's very painful, but you have to hang in there. You have to stay in the workforce and stay engaged because you're working for your income and your value 10 years down the road and 15 years down the road and 20 years down the road. So for me, a lot of it is is just how women have access to money, how they think about money and 
because that just brings so many freedoms and it brings options and opportunities to even pay for, for education. Like for so many people that come to OrgSource for their education and for their networking, you, you need to have some degree of financial means to do such a thing. Yeah, that's, um, that's some interesting things to think about um, as well. And as, as you're speaking, you know, I'm thinking also my follow-up question to you is, is how has um, the financial and or money access to money um, been impacted by the p- pandemic? Um, but before you answer that, one of the things that, that I've experienced, and I don't know that if you're seeing this, but I've had women come to me um, because of the pandemic that left their careers and now they don't have the childcare or the income to come back full time, but they're calling me saying, Hey, Sherry, do you have project work or do you have, you know, I can work for you 10 hours a week. And, and we have a lot of those, what I call kind of more like freelance Uh folks working for us, because to your point, you want you know, I want to make sure that they continue to be able to work. And eventually, um, as things change in their lives, they can decide, you know, they can go back full time, but didn't have a huge gap in their career. Um, so are you seeing kind of similar things or different things that have, have impacted um, women, you know, because of the pandemic? Yeah, the, the data is really staggering on how many women have self-selected themselves out of what you would call traditional employment. And I think the alternative, as you're describing, is also absolutely fantastic. It's it's just you have to be really smart when you go about doing that. I think freelancing and taking on those extra projects is great. That I, I come right back to you have to brand yourself. And so even if you say, okay, I'm going to freelance, I'm going to pick up special projects, you know, still incorporate, incorporate, get your own little, your own little company. It's so easy on resources like legal zoom or in other ways to, to go about it and then, and build your brand on your LinkedIn or let people know that you're still out there and relevant because the world doesn't need to know if you've scaled back to 10 to 20 hours a a week, whatever your works for you at that point in time, but, but make sure that you have a brand presence and you're letting people know what you're doing in the world. And then that way, when you say, okay, I might want to go back to a traditional role, or I might want to um, bring in partners to work with me under my little brand, you've set yourself up appropriately for the future. Yeah, that that's great advice. I was, uh, I was also thinking the other day too, um, stay, staying connected, I think is really important. So Um, I, we had our event last week and a woman, um, that just started her, well, she started a new business right around the, um, 2020 and she's been growing that business to the point where she has an office space now and she's at the event. I was excited to have her there and was doing the way to go. Um, and she was leaving. She wasn't staying for the reception. And I said, you have to stay you have to meet people. And she said, well, I'm not really comfortable in that environment. And I was like, but you're an entrepreneur now. You have to be like, you have to do this. And I think that staying connected has always been really important to me. You know, we connected years ago, we've stayed connected here or there. Um, And I just think that's really important for women too. And Zanta obviously is, creates that environment, right? (laughs) Yeah, no, sure. You're absolutely right. So my first book that I wrote was called Connect to Influence. And it and it it's not so much a networking of book as much as it's having an executive mindset about how you go about building your your network and how you um I always say I'm a very selfish networker. And I didn't realize it for a long time until um somebody that was my number two at an association said how do you do that? And I said, what do you mean? She goes, you walk in the room and you just start telling people what you need. And so when I coach people on networking, like to the individual you're talking about, networking is very uncomfortable for many, many people. But if you think about it from a a little bit of a selfish standpoint of, of what do I need to get out of this? And then when you are standing meeting somebody new, you're not at a loss for what to say, because if you walk into the event and say, these are three things I need today. And so I'll go in and I'll meet somebody and I'll be like, Hey, I might be doing an RFP for an audit firm, or I need another membership 
coordinator, or I need um, to know what podcast you're listening to. Just think, always have in your back pocket um, questions you can ask. And it makes those networking events go so much better. But yes, I think what you said, women, um, again, could be women or men, um, but we can think of so many other reasons to walk away out of a, a networking event early or to even not go to the event mm-hmm. at all. Um, my children can tell you they've spent many a nights at home or with a sitter or with a family member because um, I'm pretty committed to networking and meeting people and then giving back to my network if I can referrals, um, compliments, whatever it is, you know, give back to your network. Yeah. So I noticed to kind of follow up on that on your LinkedIn photo, it has a caption that says, the start of amazing begins with the right question. So what are questions association leaders should be asking? I, I think the biggest one is what's going to disrupt me tomorrow. We, we talk a lot about what we want to give to our members and how great our programs are, but there's so many things disrupting us. And I think what we are seeing a lot of is for-profit commercial types of entities that are massed as membership communities uh, taking over because they just have a little bit more of speed of execution. They tend to have a more modern voice. Uh, Many of us, even Zonta, Zonta had its 100th anniversary in 2019. And Sherry, we're still trying to re-steer the ship here. And it's, it's really difficult, I think, for member organizations, particularly those of us that are too technical or or too old. And Zonta has always prided itself as being um, part of, uh, we're one of the longest standing NGOs with the United Nations. And so in the human rights space, there's all of this very formal UN speak. And that just doesn't translate anymore to the modern, modern world. So we're seeing women's organizations coming in and, and disrupting a space that where Zonta should have more members. And so I think it, it's that it's what's going to disrupt me tomorrow. And, you know, what's our, what's our voice? What's the, our social audio that we're putting out there and what's our um, digital imagery that we're putting out there. It's, We've just so many associations are these behemoth of organizations. Like I said, I, I feel like I could go look in the mirror and, and say, why is Zonta not doing better? But then I could also share, look in the mirror and, and having been here nine years, say, well, we are doing so much better than we were doing <laughs> nine years ago. Um, but I also feel like secondary brand channels are something that associations mm-hmm. are not looking enough at because if By the time people get to the boardroom, they're so in love with the organization. They want to slap the logo and the association name on everything. But if it's about the mission, if it's truly about the mission, you don't need to put your logo on everything. So Zonta is only beginning to dabble in this. So like we started an Instagram channel called First for Women, and we are building uh, videos and we do daily posts about women who are achieving firsts. either for their ethnic group or for their country or for different reasons. And we're kind of introducing it in a soft way to our board. Like, look, we can create this new thing that has this nice channel to it, but it doesn't have to lead with our our name. If people like it, then we can grow it on the back end. So I think um, association leaders should be asking themselves about what's going to disrupt me who's filling this void that I'm not filling and, you know, do I need a secondary type of a a brand channel that also has a name that makes more sense to the public? Uh, Yeah, that's a good point too. That's a very good point. Um, Just a a sidebar conversation I was having yesterday with, uh, um, you know, a kind of joke and even ourselves, I'm like, yeah, we just need to make a TikTok. I'm like, I don't know what an association would make a TikTok about, but, um, but just that, you know, going around when you're talking about like social media and, and where everybody is getting their information. I was at Trader Joe's and <laughs> if you go, if you go, if I don't know if you're on TikTok, but if you're on TikTok, a lot of people are like, oh, I found this at Trader Joe's and that at Trader Joe's. And I was talking to the cashier and she said, she goes, we end up asking like our corporate, like marketing team 
are you guys driving this content? Because we're getting so much more business of people looking for specific things because of TikTok. And they said, no, we have nothing to do with it. But they're, for them, it's been awesome because they're getting all this free marketing. Um, so I, I was in my head of wondering, like, you know, what else can we be doing different or better? Or, you know, you talk about those disruptions, like looking at what's going on in the world. And, you know, to your point about the, um, you know, first for women, like that's a great idea. And then what can you do with that, you know, content and, and things like that later on? I think that's that's fantastic. I agree. Our board hasn't released us on TikTok yet. So um, <laughs> because, again, you, you talk about over a hundred year old organization trying to figure out um, and also the demographics of our members They're They want to attract um, younger, younger voices to the table. And we keep saying, then you've got to put the younger voices in charge, like in yeah. charge, like it, put them in charge. Now don't just invite them to have a seat on a committee, like put them in charge. And, and that's so hard for so many organizations. Well, and I think it's, yeah, it's hard for myself. I, I, as you know, I bring up the the conference just because it's top of mind right now, because we just finished it on last week, but my daughters were there. And so I have a 15 year old and a 20 year old and the feedback and the critiquing (laughs) that happened was, was, it was very interesting. And they were right on, on so many things. Like they're like, yeah, someone also had an image on their presentation, but it didn't it didn't resonate with me because it didn't really go with the content and blah, blah, blah. Like just things that they're, they're, they are so get so much content. Um, you know, they're constantly on their phones and constantly looking at imagery and they're being marketed to and, and all of those things. And we got some really excellent feedback that I never, never had thought about. And even my presentation, like the night before, they're like, mom, you're using those graphics. I was like, why? I think they're cute. And they're like, no, they're like, we learned <laughs> this when we were in high school, you know, in my high school class, they said to do X, Y, and Z. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Okay. You're right. Uh, but you're right. Like, you know, I don't know that I'm going to quite ready to put them in charge, but <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're, but it you're is good right. feedback. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting. My older, my older daughter actually works in the association space. She's, um, does marketing communications for a, um, an association in downtown Chicago. Uh, and I also have a daughter who just turned 16 and even, even they see the world completely different, completely differently. Um, and it's, and they don't put so much thought into it. It's, it's a little bit more fleeting. You put it out there. You make people smile, you make people laugh, you make people think, move on to the next thing you're going to put out. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, switching gears a little bit, uh, what are you feel are the biggest challenges for female uh, executives today? Um, and how can they exert greater influence in our communities? Great, great question. I think we we touched on a little before is is you've got to be intentional about building your personal network because if you want somebody to promote you, they have to know about you to promote you. So this is still, the association space is still, which I think I should agree, Sherry, it is still so word of mouth. Like we all are looking for shortcuts um, and we can interact on the digital boards, like the CEO board on ASAE or association forum, but it's still, you know, who's in my trusted network that's going to promote me or that, you know, to others, if there's another job opportunity or who's going to be my counsel to solve a a problem um, or to make me look smarter to my board. Right. Um, It's so hard. I think being an executive director, because all the associations are so different. I mean, there's commonalities, but you could be top of your game at one change your job, go to another one, and all of a sudden feel like you're failing miserably. So I think it's just being intentional with your network and, but also being willing to promote the others in your network. I think, again, I I work in the gender space, so I don't want to sound stereotypical to anybody that's listening, but, you know, you... I I started off in Detroit. I shared that early on and it was the automotive industry and it was a good old union boy Mm -hmm. network. 
And I would sit back and observe what was going on. And, you know, those men worked the same number of hours a week as me, and they made a lot more money and had corner offices and came to the office with their golf clubs because they would go golfing. And so early on, I, I started observing and I'm like, if I have to work the same amount of hours, I want to make as much money as possible. So I know that might be a little crazy, Sherry, that as that was my motivation when I was young. I was like, we're working the same hours. What do they know that I don't know? And it was very um, probably naive how I approached it. But I watched the, these the gentlemen and they were constantly introducing others to their network. You know, hey, this is John. He's a great guy. You need to know him. And I, I think inherently a lot of us don't do that. You know, we we don't promote or take people along. Like, like you know, Sherry, we were, we were talking about uh, org source events. So it's always good to take somebody to an event with you so you're not alone, but that's not the point. It's, it's take them with you and then introduce them to a whole lot of people. And I right. think we as, as, as women in the executive director space, we need to do more of, Hey, you need to know so-and-so and just connect them on, on LinkedIn. And, and that's it. We just don't do enough of inter- making those introductions or we call it sponsoring each other. Yes. Yes. Well, I had mentioned the woman that was leaving and she made the excuse that, that she had to get home with her kids. It might've been a valid excuse, um, I think she was just trying to sneak out. And I said, no, you need to meet these people. So that's what I did. It was really, I introduced her to a group that was together and she's a recruiter. So at the end of her, she stayed the whole entire time after that, but she um, has a position she's recruiting for that she found somebody. And then I saw people taking her business card and I was like, yes, this is what, this is what, this is why you stay. Right. So, um, but it's those little things that, yeah, you almost have to be very intentional. And I think it's a very good point because that's what men do. Right. And they're, you know, they know their buddy over here now can help them with X, Y, or Z, and we should be doing the same thing. Um, so what would you, what advice would you give to a new, uh, association CEO? So, on a, on a practical level, if they're not a CAE, that they get their CAE. I, I always say, um, I don't know, sure, I hate the CAE exam. I passed on the first try, but I, I think it's uh, a tough exam. But the pursuit of it, of, of reading the legal law books and, and going to the events where you're um, trying to perfect your craft, your profession, I think that is my number one thing if, if you haven't got it. Once you have it, I think it's, it's knowing that you hold the vision with the capital V. And and we talk about as the executive director, you need to know where, I always say where that flagpole is. Where is the flagpole that you're moving everybody to? Whether it's your board, whether it's your committees, whether it's your internal staff, like what's the vision with the capital V? What's that flagpole on the hill that everybody is, is heading towards? And you have to be able to see it when nobody else can see it. And I was sharing before we started talking that um, I'm very comfortable with gray space and creating structure out of a little bit of, of chaos. And I can see, I think this is why when I got the degree as a teacher and then went to business, it made me so successful because teachers are trained to know ultimately where everybody is supposed to be by, you know, the mm-hmm. end of the semester or, oh, or yeah. by the time of the test and, and you work it backwards in your head. And so I've always been able to to see where we need to be and work it backwards in my in my head. And the other thing for the new um, CEO is, you know, what what are the tools and resources you have to shortcut your way to success? Which doesn't mean doing it less than, uh, but you know, your networks are your shortcut to 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 success. Your association memberships, memberships and organizations like yours, these are your shortcuts to success um, because you can belabor over something all by yourself or you can grab a couple of brilliant minds to help you get to where you need to be. Um, so those are just a couple pieces pieces of advice that I would give to people and, and just bring a, a big dose of um, humility <laughs> to everything you do. <laughs> 
Um, so to switch gears a little bit, I wanted to ask you about um, a little more about branding. Do you feel like the t- technology has impacted branding? Yeah, there's so much MarTech on the market. And sometimes you you can say the person with the be- best marketing wins. Um, the fundamentals of branding are, are still really key. I think what gets difficult is so many of our associations like Zonta, we have we've grown over the years and, and sometimes everything doesn't quite fit underneath our, our, what I would say our right branding, but it's beloved by the organization. Um, knowing your brand is, is so, so critical and also keeping to validate the concept of your, of your brand and knowing when it's time to move. But the technology is sometimes putting the brand in too many people's hands and they can take it in too many different directions. So um, I feel like I'm constantly wrangling cats when it comes to brand, even my board members, like, look, we have these brand guidelines, happy to change the brand guidelines. But as long as these are, these are the voted brand guidelines, this is, this is what we're living within. Um, But yeah, marketing has the, the, the MarTech tools, are rapidly changing everything. And just because we can create it on on Canva and create it super cute, right? (laughs) Doesn't mean that we're keeping it on brand. Right. Um, Right. And Mm -hmm. so that's, that is a challenge that I think we all, we all struggle with. When I first started at Zonta, I know I drove my staff crazy because I made them print out everything we do and tape it up on a wall. I took our biggest open wall in our office. And I said, anything we do, any email we put out, it's got to get taped up on this, on this wall. And it needs to look like it's part of a a family, unless it's a brand channel. And then that brand channel has its own uniqueness. Um, And I'm very, I want to say, I'm going to use the word blessed that my assistant executive director and my communications manager have been with me the whole nine, the whole nine years. So we've been able to get some of that brand consistency in things. So what are your tips that um, associations can do to strengthen their brands? Uh, Do a brand audit. That's, that's the number one, really do a brand audit and make sure that you're, you're taking a look at everything that you actually have and you're currently producing and make it easy for people to get things, even, even your PowerPoint templates, mm-hmm. and, you know, make it easy for your committee members or your workshop presenters or, you know, everything needs to, you need to think about your brand voice. Your brand voice is, is critical, even um, your email signatures. So we standardized email signatures and the communications manager sends a refresh every now and then. Um, so you just have to be so in, intentional, but a brand audit and then making the, the, the tools um, easily accessible. We have a standards guide for how we do abbreviations or how we do our capitalization. Like we, we try to get it out, but it's hard. Again, we're in 63 countries. It's really hard to, to keep it all together, so to speak, that we don't have somebody slap a koala bear on our logo (laughs) in Australia, but, (laughs) but but no, yeah, I think it's that it's, it's that, and that you work with a marketing firm that, that has done a nice brand story for you, that you have a nice, um, you know, digital brand story that you can use when you onboard staff or onboard board members, that it's, you know, you're all trying to at least start at a cohesive point. So Allison, before we wrap up, I know you have your own podcast. I had mentioned CEO Nation, um, which is fantastic. So what is your favorite question to ask your guests and how would you answer it? Yeah, it's disruptive CEO Nation. CEO Nation is big, but it's disruptive. And I talk to company founders and entrepreneurs and, and thought leaders. And the question I like to ask them is, and I usually start pretty early is what delightful thing do you deliver to the world? Um, because it's not about necessarily their, their, just their company name. It's, it's this concept that we all deliver things to the world. We're all creators. It's, it's just how we want to position that. So I like to ask people what delightful thing they, they deliver to the world um, and, and usually phrase it around some sort of happy slant because 
I want people to feel good when they come on my podcast and, and they're interviewed. And I want to draw out these you know, cool stories that they have that makes them unique. And yeah, so Sherry, that's where I usually try to start off with. I love that. I love that. So anything else um, you want to share today before we wrap up? I know you are very busy and I appreciate all your time. This has been a great conversation. No, I just would say I'm so passionate about helping younger professionals move up in their, their careers. I really think that people don't think enough about like taking a whiteboard and drawing a 10 year plan for themselves. Like these are the types of positions I might be interested in. This is the type of salary benchmarks I want to have. And I know I mentioned that I've had my, some of my team members stay with me for a very long time because we've always tried to grow people from within. But I think people owe it to themselves when it comes to their career to make sure that they have, you know, every three months, they've got some resume highlights, whether they're in their same job or in a new job. So I think, Sherry, I'm just, I'm passionate about helping people along. I'm always open to connect with people on LinkedIn. So happy to, to network and meet more people if I can through this podcast. Great. So if someone wants to get in touch with you or um, learn more about Zanta, how do they do that? Go to LinkedIn. That's the, that's the first place. So I'm Allison Summers on LinkedIn. I think I'm Allison Summers Chicago. And, or they can look up at Zonta.org, Z-O-N-T-A.org and find out more about the organization. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate uh, all of your time today and um, I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, Sherry. We hope you enjoyed this episode and discovered tips and information that will add value to your leadership style and your association. .org Source specializes in positioning teams for success with solutions for technology, strategy, and marketing. Please contact us at info at orgsource.com or visit www.orgsource.com to find out how to keep your organization on track to Association 4.0.